Hello everybody, it's Kate here and welcome back uh, to Moss on a Monday. I, I took a couple of months off as you know because I was on tour in the UK with my one woman show, uh, Warrior Queens and Quiet Revolutionaries, but that didn't mean I wasn't reading all of the time. Uh, so I'm back to share a few books with you. Now normally I do two fiction and two non-fiction, but June is Women's Prize Month. Uh, the 28th Women's Prize for Fiction winner will be announced in a few days time but we'll also be announcing the Women's Prize for Nonfiction, which will begin in 2024. So, in honour of that, I've decided that today I'm going to do four non-fiction books to share with you. Some come off my shelf, some are brand new, and I hope you'll love them. So, here comes the first one, which some of you might have read when it first came out in 2008, and it is The Suspicions of Mr Witcher, The Murder at Road Hill House by Kate summer scale and it won the uh, Samuel Johnson Prize uh, in 2009 I think. Now this is perfect actually as a piece of uh, narrative non-fiction of true crime and it tells the story of a murder uh, on the 29th of June 30th of June 1860 at a house in Wiltshire a middle-class home in Wiltshire uh, where a husband and a wife were asleep they had their three children very close by um, and on the floor above, uh, the children from his previous marriage. And in the house, there was also the nursemaid and various other people who looked after the house servants and all of this kind of thing. Now, what was so extraordinary is this is the moment that the idea of the detective becomes, um, well, grips public attention. Uh, the very first fictional detective, of course, was Dupont in The Murders in the Rue Morgue by uh, Edgar Allan Poe, and that was 1841. And in 1842, the first detectives, eight of them, were employed in London. And Jack Witcher, Jonathan Witcher, known as Jack, uh, was one of them. He's a real character, and we know what he looked like because Dickens wrote about him. He wrote about him as a journalist and described what he looked like. And this was the case that threatened to break his career and turned the idea of a gentleman detective into somebody who was inappropriately prying into people's lives, their private homes. Uh, what Kate Summerscale does so brilliantly is, if, you know, I'm, of course I'm going to say this, it's like a novel, it reads like a novel, but she sets up the family, she sets up the background to the family, she describes uh, the murder itself of a little boy, the son of the second marriage, who was nearly four, and when they wake up, the family wakes up on the 30th of June, uh, 1860, the boy is not in his cot and a blanket is missing. And takes us through the discovery of the body, all of the various people who came under suspicion, all of the dirty linen, if you like, that was washed in public with the case. And the twist at the end, which of course I'm not gonna spoil for you, uh, when they don't really solve the case, but Mr. Witcher, Jack Witcher has his suspicions and his suspicions turn out to be right. And then a few years later, somebody confesses. It's an absolutely fantastic book. I, I read it when it came out and I went back to it and it really is the gold standard in how to write true crime without being salacious, without being pornographic, if you like. It's just good old fashioned detective work and explains, I suppose, why so many of us love crime fiction. So that is The Suspicions of Mr. Witcher um, and it was published and is published by Bloomsbury. The next book I'm going to share with you um, also is not brand new. It came out actually in 2021 and it is by, um, I would say, one of the most important thinkers and writers of the present time and that is Olivia Lang. Uh, this is a proof copy um, but the real jacket it will be on your screen and it's called Everybody a book about freedom. And when I was thinking about why I wanted to do this and how to talk about it, it's very, very difficult because it is a work of philosophy. It's a work of social history. It's a work of feminism. It's a work of history in a way and the history of thought and the history of science and psychotherapy in particular. And the basic premise of it is Olivia Lang thinking about the body as the place where we hold trauma, if you like. Um, and looking into different people who have different theories about uh, illness, about how we live in and outside of our bodies, what bodies mean. Um, and it, you know, when I say this, I re realize I'm making it sound terribly waffly um, and unclear, but it, it, it's crystal clear because she is such an extraordinary thinker. And she uses as her 
almost her guide, uh, a man called Wilhelm Reich, who was incredibly important in thinking about uh, the body, about sexual liberation of the body, um, was a young student of Freud, was very much part of the Freud-Jung uh, battles, and then became very, very discredited. He was Jewish and he fled to America, and he became very discredited for all sorts of uh, reasons. But she goes through in each chapter uh, talking not only about him and his ideas, the ones she agrees with and the ones she doesn't, because she's incredibly good at being a critical friend to big thinkers of the 19th and 20th century and saying, I agree with this and I don't agree with that. And that's a breath of fresh air as <laughs> we're in times that are very divisive. You know, you're all for somebody, all against somebody, but of course, real complicated thought that changes the world and changes people's mind is nuanced. And she takes us through incredible artists like the great Anna Mendieta, the Cuban-American artist who used her own body to talk about experiences of rape and then was well, almost definitely murdered uh, by her husband. Uh, she talks about Andrea Dworkin, she talks about Kate Millett, uh, she talks about Freud, about Christopher Isherwood, uh, Susan Sontag, Malcolm X. So it's a guide to thought of the 19th and 20th century, but always through the idea that the body keeps the score if you like, the body keeps the score. So it's, I, I think I've, I don't think I've done it justice because it's very hard to explain it, but she's a beautiful writer, great clarity. Um, and it is about how politics works, how people use ideas that have been made with good intentions to support rather invidious and horrible bigotries. Um, but she is, the most extraordinary character and I would love to sit down at the table and just hear her read this book out loud. So this came out in 2021, it's published by Picador, Everybody, a book about freedom by Olivia Lang. I cannot recommend it highly enough. I had the most uh, incredible experience being on tour in theatres with my one woman show. And one of the things that um, I said right at the beginning was, does anybody know who is the author of the very first credited science fiction novel, a novel that gave a new genre, I suppose, to literature? And always people would call out and, go, and, and say, yes, yes, we know. And I would say, it's not who you're thinking of. You think I'm talking about Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, published in 1818. But in fact, I'm talking about a novel called The Blazing World that was published in 1666 uh, by the Duchess of Newcastle, Margaret Cavendish. And everybody oohed and aahed and it was incredibly exciting. And then I got home from tour and discovered I had been sent a proof of pretty much the first modern biography of Margaret Cavendish. And it's called Pure Wit. The Revolutionary Life of Margaret Cavendish, and it's by Francesca Peacock, and it's going to be coming out from Head of Zeus in September. Now, I, I don't tend to choose books that are not yet out, because I know it's annoying for everybody, but it was just such an extraordinary thing that I'd come across this incredible woman, and here, finally, was a biography. Now, she was born in 1623 into an aristocratic family, and this was the build-up to the English Civil War, and she was part of the court and she went into exile with Queen Henrietta. But what she was, was well, she was a thinker and she was a scientist. And she was also a woman who uh, knew what celebrity was. That she dressed and spoke and talked always about wanting to be famous, that everybody would recognize her. She had no apology for wanting to be seen as unique and distinctive. And this quote that they have on the proof, my ambition is not only to be empress, but authoress of a whole world. And that's a line from The Blazing World. She wrote many other things, uh, but all the way through, she made herself distinctive. And we know a lot about what she looked like because Samuel Pepys was clearly both fascinated by her and rather entranced and beguiled by her, but also probably rather scared of her frankly, um, and some of the descriptions of her arriving uh, to see a play in London and, you know, she has a very low cut dress and she has extraordinary hats on um, and she was told off actually for all of her own servants being dressed inappropriately, you know, they were in velvet hats and, and breeches. So the this um, biography, Francesca Peacock, hopes to do, to really put her back where she belongs in history as an important writer. One of the reasons 
she has rather disappeared from history. It's not just that her books are uh, not in print and her poetry and her pamphlets, and particularly The Blazing World, uh, but because I'm afraid Virginia Woolf had it in for her. And Virginia Woolf very much reclaimed Afra Ben, who was one of the extraordinary writing women of the 17th century. And this was a period when many women were writing, but women were traduced for writing. Women were traduced and criticised for being um, outgoing, for being visible, for having their own points of view. And in a rather famous essay, uh, Virginia Woolf compares Afra Ben uh, to uh, uh, to Margaret Cavendish and Margaret Cavendish comes out very badly. She's seen painted as eccentric and rather silly and rather uninteresting. But this I would say is a book about, the word didn't exist then, but about a feminist, about uh, a woman who took the world on on her own terms, was an extraordinary writer and should be much better known. And the joy of it landing in my lap when I had just come off stage after two and a half months of writing and then being on the road and talking about this incredible woman who nobody in any audience had heard of and then discovering that soon lots more people will hear it first. So please do pre-order this. Francesca Peacock, Pure Wit. Um, in a way, the subtitle should be The Life and Times of Margaret Cavendish, the Duchess of Newcastle. My final uh, choice for June's Moss on a Monday is an old favourite and a really significant uh, book for me. And it is um, the English translation of Montaigne, uh, Emmanuel Le Roy Ladurie, uh, who is a French uh, historian and specialist in the Cathar history um, and the history of the region of Languedoc. And the book was first published in French in 1978 and then published into English, published by Penguin in 1980. And it is one of those books that transform the idea of how you wrote very detailed domestic history about the past. Uh, but also for me, it was my Bible, my Bible, when I was researching and writing Labyrinth. And the village of Montaillou is a real village in the Pyrenees, in the Ariège, and it is a kind of a mini biography, really, of that village and all the people that lived in it at the end of the 13th century and the beginning of the 14th century, um, when Catharism, as the great French historian Anne Brunel put it, was becoming a whisper. Those of you who have read Labyrinth uh, will know that that is set between the invasion in 1209 and 1244, the historic period, and this starts a little bit later. Uh, but it is the life and times of Cathars and Catholics in this one village. And it showed that it was possible to use a tiny piece of very quiet history in a weird sort of way to make the entire case about religious conflict, about how the world was changing. And it's all the people who live in the village and you know the, the arguments between them, everybody's names are there because they're in the records um, and everybody from the shepherd uh, to the most important person to the priests in the village and the reality of their lives. The thing that is a challenge and interesting whenever you're looking back into the past, and particularly if, like me, with the Cathars or now the Huguenots with my Juba family chronicles, uh, you are looking at religious conflict and who, where the testimony comes from. All of uh, La Durie's uh, information comes from the Jacques Fournier register, and he was the inquisitor who was interrogating everybody. So, of course, how truthful were they? Uh, you know, many people, of course, will say whatever they want. There is this idea, absolutely rightly, that Cathars uh, would not lie, and therefore the Inquis Inquisitional registers are more truthful than they might be in, you know, many of the rec records we have of the spy catchers in Britain, for example, Walsingham and all of those people, because the tortures were appalling. And there was always the idea that the Cathars told the truth, and of course, many of them might have told the truth, but of course others might not have done uh, to get away with it and not to be executed and not to be um, asked to recant their faith. But it is the most detailed, beautiful, it, it's like being dropped into a film set when you read it and you become very um, passionately connected to all the different characters. You can see that tiny petty grievances are being played out. Um, so there is the big sweep of history, but on the, you know, in the micro level, there's 
he doesn't like her and she fancies him and everybody's fallen out and everybody's lying about things to get through. But it is beautiful, really, and it is touching. And it changed the way that people realised you could write about the invisible people of the past. Now, with my book, Warrior Queens and Quiet Revolutionaries, obviously I'm focusing on unheard and underheard women's stories. But it's precisely the same idea that often only a tiny band of people are written about in the history books, but it's possible to write about ordinary people, for want of a better word, and make them vivid and wonderful and our guides to the present by understanding the lives that they lived in the past. Now, so many people, of course, have read this. It's been in print ever since, and I was delighted when I was thinking about sharing this book with you to discover that La Durie is still alive. He's 93 and still writing. This was by far his most um, popular book, and it found uh, great favour with academics as well as the general public. And again, that was the, the beginning of a narrative history that those of us who were not historians could still enjoy fantastic, detailed, brilliant books about certain periods of history. Um, if you've not read it, give it a go. Uh, Labyrinth in the form it is would not exist if I'd not read Montaigne uh, right back in the day when I first went to Carcassonne and fell in love with the history of the region and fell in love with the wonderful present and the bloody past of the Cathars. Um, so I feel I owe it a great deal. So it was wonderful to go back and reread it. So that's it for June. Um, the Women's Prize, by the time you're listening to this, will be being announced. Uh, we will know who's won the 28th Women's Prize for Fiction and next year will be the first ever Women's Prize for Nonfiction. Um, I'll be back in July, just before I go on tour with my new novel, The Ghost Ship, um, but I'm gonna record it and get it in the bag before I go out on the road. And you know that's a story of, well, it's a love story, it's a story of revenge, and it's piracy on the high seas of the Atlantic Ocean around the Canary Islands. Um, and I'm really looking forward to that. Thank you all so much for your comments about Moss on a Monday, for all of you who came to the One Woman Show, for all of you who continue. Um, to send messages through social media or other ways about the books of mine that you loved or the books that I talk about that you've loved. It's always a conversation. Uh, books, I still believe, change the world. Uh, you stand in other people's shoes. They bring us delight, entertainment, challenge us. Um, and that's all that Moss on a Monday is about. So I'll be back in July with two fiction and two non-fiction. And just remember, it doesn't matter what you're reading, but enjoy it and share it with other people. See you soon.